The scheme, at the risk of getting st diving straight into the legislation, is actually supported by Commonwealth legislation, the National Disability Insurance Scheme Act, the NDIS Act 2013. And Diane has already talked about the scale of disability in this country in terms of you know, 4 million people with disability, perhaps 2.2 million people with significant disability. It needs to be borne in mind that this scheme is not intended to be a panacea for every disability in Australia. It represents basically, on one view, about 25 per cent, or in fact less than that, perhaps 12.5 per cent, um, of the total number of people with disability who will be eligible to be clients under the scheme, 460 to 475,000 people with significant disability, people who are under the age of 65 at the time the scheme rolls into their part of the world where they're living, people, um, um, pe people who um, have a disability um, which requires which is ongoing, which is permanent, um, which is serious and which impacts their social and economic participation, or people and or people who require early intervention in order to optimise their um, life outcomes. The scheme is not a case of you get everything and a set of steak knives when it comes to supports. Um, in order um, to access supports, um, a participant must be able to demonstrate that the support is reasonable and necessary, both. And that's certainly presented some opportunities and challenges for many scheme participants already. Okay. Just to basically briefly take you through the concept of reasonable and necessary, the support must assist the participant, the person with disability. I hate that jargon, but that, nevertheless, that's what the people, people with disability are described as under the Act. The support will assist the participant to pursue their goals, objectives and aspirations. The support will assist the participant's social and economic participation. It will represent quote unquote value for money, and that phrase does appear in the Act. It will be effective and beneficial, and the funding or provision of support considers what is reasonable to expect families, carers, informal networks, and the community to provide. And that's proving to be particularly critical because, of course, um, insofar as families and, care and carers' networks have historically provided a lot of informal support, there's ongoing, I hesitate to use the word battles, but certainly dis debates and disputes. Um, between providers, participants and the agency as to the extent to which it's reasonable to expect families and carers to continue to provide a level of informal support in circumstances where those supports might otherwise be funded. And insofar as they are funded, those families and carers may therefore be released, I hesitate to use the phrase, but released to actually, for example, undertake work of their own, paid work of their own in terms of optimising economic outcomes. And the other, the other criteria is that the support is most appropriately funded or provided through the NDIS. And there's another challenge in that regard. Because, of course, that phrase is intended to also draw the reader to the fact that state governments, traditionally the funders of mainstream services, are not um, allowed or not being allowed to vacate the field in terms of some of the supports they've historically provided to people with disability through mainstream services. It's not a case that every single support that a child with disability going to school may require is going to be funded under the NDIS. There's this agreement between Commonwealth and state governments that says, for example, that insofar as these supports are necessary for the child to undertake education, that those supports should be continued to, funded, continue, continue to be funded by the state, by, by the Victorian government in our case. But insofar as those supports are required by the child for general purposes, for example, if they, require, if they require support to go to the toilet, they'll require it whether, whether or not they're at or outside of school, then a support of that nature will be funded under the, under the NDIS. And if that definition is as clear as mud to you, it's because it, it's a function of an agreement struck by the Council of Australian Governments in, in a, basically in a period of an afternoon, after about six to 12 months' worth of work by state and Commonwealth government officials. Um, it's fair to say that there is still a lot of grey in terms of what's in and what's outside the National Disability Insurance Scheme, which in and of itself represents challenges for your prospective clients, providers of disability services. Now, Diane has already traversed some of this, um, some of the detail on the key reforms, um, in terms of the key reforms that the NDIS represents. Um, I suppose what I'd say is that, um, from from the point of view of our sector. Um, it's tremendously important that this scheme survives and thrives. The fact of the matter is that historically disability services in this country have been um, chronically underfunded and have never been funded by state governments of any political colour to meet demand for services. For those of you who are not aware, up until the NDIS came along, the Victorian government, for example, 
both major political parties or political coalitions, as the case may be, were overseers of a scheme locally in which the list of people who were determined to have a disability but hadn't yet won the misery lottery, they weren't badly disabled enough, the list was running up to in excess of 3,500 people languishing, waiting for someone to die or no longer require supports and therefore to get off the list and into the space where they are entitled to access supports. And for many of those people, that essentially consigned them to a life of isolation and misery. Now, I don't say that the scheme has immediately produced happiness and light, but it certainly, in terms of it being entitlements rather than a ration-based scheme, represents in its concept, if not always in its delivery, delivery a massive improvement on what the states were, were overseeing in the past in terms of their system. We're seeing um, an increased emphasis under the scheme of choice and control. Again, a potential cliche until you realise that um, the uh, state governments, well, the way that funding is travelling is not from, from governments to providers but from the agency to participants who then get to choose within the context of a plan that they have approved or have agreed with the agency those supports they wish to avail themselves of to achieve particular lifetime goals and aspirations. As I think Diana alluded to, basically um, the funding is indeed in most instances attached to individuals. It changes the relationship between governments, clients and providers. And it's certainly, in terms of how it's been designed, producing already a new and potentially more competitive market for disability services. I say potentially because some, you know, in terms of what we're seeing right at the moment, we are seeing a certain level of market consolidation amongst providers already in the sector. I don't think it would be um, a correct assertion for anyone to make to say that what we're seeing is a, a massive number of new and innovative supports coming out, out and about at the moment. What we're starting to see is the growth of a new market for services. But to the extent that, and we'll talk about some of the challenges, to the, to the extent that some of the challenges are proving particularly challenging for some providers, in some instances we're actually seeing rather than an increase in choice of provider, in some parts of Australia we're seeing a contraction because some providers, let's be very frank, are not going to survive the NDIS because of the way it's been designed. So let's talk about the way it's been designed and what's different. For participants, but, um, um, for participants, they get to decide what supports they need, how to use their funding and who will provide their supports. For providers, it means they're engaged by participants to deliver supports in accordance with their plan, with the participants' plan. Funding is allocated to participants and not the provider, and providers enter into a service agreement with participants setting out the individualised supports they will deliver. Funding goes with a participant wherever they live. In other words, we no longer have this situation where if you were moving from Camberwell to Coolangatta, um, essentially you'd have to re-establish your eligibility in Queensland in order to get access to the same supports that you were getting in Victoria. That no longer is the case, thank God. And prov providers are paid retrospectively rather than prospectively for the delivery of services. So it's not just a change in the funding model, it represents a, a you know, systemic reform or sy systems reform as well. 